Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hello, welcome to another edition of Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice from Above the Law, and today we are recording in two separate places, so I can't see my co-host, but I know he's out there. Ellie? I am just happy to be out of goddamn costume. Oh, yes. No, uh, for those of you who don't already follow him on Twitter, which I don't know why you wouldn't, he's at L-E-N-Y-C, you saw the costume that he was forced to wear last night, but tell us a little bit about your... uh, your turn as a Pokemon. All right. So my kids, my my oldest seven year old, he he wanted to go as Pokemons. He want and we usually do family costumes, so we all go as something, right? So this year he wanted to go as Pokemon. That's fine. Um, he was Pikachu. The little one was Snorlax. We had this all set. I was going to be Charmander or Chaharzar, depending on whether or not I got the wings in time, right? So I don't want to do this. I'm not. I'm not a Halloween fan i don't like dressing up and having my kids go out into the street and beg for candy that's like not me Mm -hmm. um but you know whatever you got kids you do what you gotta do my wife's into halloween my mother is like crazy super halloween person so i get into my charizard costume so that i can surprise the boys when they're getting off the bus coming home from school okay that all works great then my wife gets home and she's all like yeah, you know, we obviously we had planned this. She knew what I was going as. And she's like, Yeah, your costume, it's just not big enough. And I'm like, Well, sorry, lady, ain't nothing you can do about it, right? Oh, like, so, it, it, so by big enough, what were you going as sexy Shaharzard or <laughs> No, she wasn't making a fat joke. At least that's not how I interpret it in real time. I, I actually meant short skirt kind of a thing, but interesting, you <laughs> took it to that direction. There are many ways this can go. All right, and it's all going badly. Go on. It's all going badly for me, right? <laughs> but no, my, my, my took it as that it wasn't kind of loud enough for my personality, knowing that I don't like to have a big personality on Halloween. So I was like, basically, tough nuggies, lady. She's like, actually, I can do something about it. And she pulls out of the closet, unbeknownst to me, what my actual costume was, which was this giant blow-up Pikachu thing that I literally had to to get into, then sit still while it inflated around me. I had to take off my glasses because they were fogging up, and I can barely see without my glasses, besides the fact that I'm looking out of this thing's mouth hole. And I had to waddle around my neighborhood in front of my neighbor's in this giant Pikachu costume. And you might think, oh, well, anonymity was preserved. Not on my street. I like, my neighbors know my family, and so they know, oh, that must be Ellie in the giant Pikachu costume. It was, you know, and I'm, and like the kids at first were just like guiding me because, you know, I can't see. Um, but of course, as they get into it, they're, they're just abandoning me in the street to go running after candy. So I'm like walking into cars and knocking over trash cans. It was just my life. And like, I couldn't see her, but the entire time I just hear my goddamn wife, like cackling, cackling in the distance for her. She would call it genius. Yeah. No, I mean that, that sounds awful. I, um, what'd you go as? I was regularly dressed in a bar, but you know, actually, that's <laughs> not true. I actually went uh, as dignity. Um, <laughs> that's not know. as good as your best Halloween costume. You want to tell the people that? My best Halloween costume? Uh, well, I, I was going to follow up on dignity. I was wearing a shirt with a weird design on it with no explanation. If people asked me what I was, I was going to say it was dignity because the design is from the episode of Simpsons where Kirk and Luann get divorced over a Pictionary game because he draws this weird thing. He says, come on, Luann, it's dignity. That's right. (laughs) So I was just wearing that, hoping someone would ask what I was wearing so I could say, (laughs) you're not going to get it? I'll show it to the cat. The cat's going to get it. Um, So yeah, so I was where I went as dignity, technically. Uh, My favorite Halloween time was an instance where I was hosting a party, so I didn't have to go outside, which allowed me to use a wheelchair all day and be FDR. And I did up the whole FDR thing. It was it was pretty 
pretty elaborate. It did require me occasionally to stand up and do things around the party, at which point I would become Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt, because <laughs> he could still move around then. But yeah, that's what I, that was my most elaborate uh, stab at dressing up. That year, um, I went to your house for that party, and I mm -hmm. went as Jimmy McMillan, the yes. rent is too damn high guy. Um, which that was, was fun. a pretty good one, actually. Yeah. For it, like, I mean, it, it was no Pikachu, but it was it was pretty good. In any yeah. event, that's what yeah. I'm pissed about. I I, I guess it, technically that was grinding gears, but I'm actually happy because I'm out of the Pikachu costume and I've lost ten pounds. So that's also good. Yeah. No. Um, dressing up as animals, which brings us to. Today's episode is brought to you by your cat, Mr. Whiskers, who's very <laughs> mad at you and thinking about moving in with your ex, all because you're still at the office slogging through an endless doc review project. Make better decisions, keep your pet, and work smarter with Logical, e-discovery software that gets you started in minutes. Live in the meow. Create a free account today at logical.com forward slash ATL. That's logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash A-T-L. So you, you you just said live in the meow. I did say live in the meow. Yeah, no, and I'm I'm feeling great about it. Actually, I you know animal animals have been kind of dominating our legal news lately because we had Lawyer Cat, obviously the greatest episode of the show's history, but also we have now a bird that's loose in Harvard's law library. Yeah, can you explain that story? Because I don't get it. So there's a bird in the li law library somehow managed to get into the law library and they can't get it out. And it's just flying around the library and nobody knows how to get a hold of it. Yeah. Can you explain that story? Because I don't get how that's a story. It's a bird. It there's happens. A, Langdell a, is large. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. There, I've been in a lot of large buildings that don't have birds in them. Uh, like you usually find birds getting into large things. Like you'll find them in a department store, not a department store, but like a super store, Walmart kind of thing. But that's because they're flying in through the, the loading and unloading docks, these large openings that, you know, you can't really police. But a, I would assume a law library is the sort of, sort of structure that can only be entered through normal sized human doors. And <laughs> that's why this is a little weird. But no, the bird is causing terror all over the all over the stacks. Uh, it's getting food from the law students who are in there, and that's keeping its energy up. The bird now has a Twitter account, by the way. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's... The bird has a Twitter account. It has a bunch of followers, but it's only following one account, which is the account that exists for the stray cat that occasionally hangs out in Langdell. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, bird needs to keep tabs on that cat. So, I'm still. I mean, Langdell is a beautiful building. I think it's. I think Langdell is the is easily the most beautiful building on the Harvard Law campus, and I think definitely in the the top two or three buildings on the Harvard University campus as a whole. Um, I feel like it's outlived its usefulness. Like I, 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 I do not know what to tell a young student now why they would ever need to go into a law library. Other than like their dorm sucks, so it's like a yeah. nicer place to study. But like, as a functional building, it's might as well uh, feed some birds while you're in there because it's it it doesn't do anything. Well, I mean, this is kind of the the struggle when it comes to legal research, and obviously, organizations like Westlaw, who uh, sponsors above the law a lot. These these sort of research engines, uh, and there's more than just Westlaw, obviously, have taken a lot of the legal research that you would ever need and put it online such that it can be accessed from pretty much anywhere. And that leads people to feel as though the law library isn't important anymore. And there's some truth to the idea that you don't need nearly as much of a footprint. You don't need to have all those federal reporters in print form now that every all those cases are digitized. That said, there's other reasons why the law library is important, and it's not just because of a study hall situation, but there are records and primary sources that you can't get in digitized form, and they're important for that. And those, they're, now, that's not the sort of work that a 1L, 2L may be doing, but a well, at the point that you're writing a note or some sort of or if you're faculty, certainly, and writing something more robust about, you know, 
just general legal scholarship, having access to primary sources, you know, handwritten notes of people and stuff like that. That's what a library is still always going to be needed for. So, I think you're I think you're absolutely yeah. right in terms of faculty. Like the law library exists for faculty the same way that any um, research library exists for full time scholars, mm -hmm. um, and, and exactly because you say of the primary documents of the historical records um, that are kept in there. I was talking more from the perspective of, of a student. Like yeah. it's it's for a one L, Langdell is just a prettier place to study. I mean, yeah, uh, totally. And, and I'll, I'll say that as a as a law student, I I was there, you know. 20 years ago, and the library was already at that point no longer a place that you needed to be as a student. Uh, already, the primary works that you would need to interact with as a student had moved into digital form, and it was just there as a cool place to study. I do feel, though, like as a back back in those days, and I'm, I'm just about as old as you, so you know, 20 or so years ago, um, I do feel that because, you know, Westlaw, Lexus, these technologies were there and established, but still kind of emerging, there was some, uh, you know, you could go to the library and get some, you know, Boolean search help, right? Like the, the oh, research yeah. librarian was still kind of a thing at least 20 years ago in a way that even, even that position has been digitize out of our existence. To the, I actually don't know about that. I, I'd, I'd pull back on that. I actually think that as a resource, while the library is less of a resource, the librarians are still very important because, because of the way in which they can, they can see through. And, and algorithms are obviously always going to be evolving and making this a little bit easier. But research librarians are in a position to say, oh, this is what you're after? Did you realize you should be looking over here? In ways that sometimes aren't obvious to algorithms. So right, right, right. I, I still think that that's a resource that's very valuable. And in a lot of ways, I feel as though, and I haven't gone to AAAL, which is the Law Librarian Conference that we usually send someone to. Unfortunately, it's just always happened during a week that I'm not available to travel to it. But I'd love to because I, I get the sense that the role of the law librarian is somewhat evolving to be not just a librarian, but also to be kind of a go-to legal tech expert because so much of that work is becoming, here's how you deal with the algorithm that's supposed to tell you where to find things. This is how the search should be structured so that you get the maximum of what you want. Uh, and that transition into the tech world is an interesting evolution of a job that obviously has existed in a very analog form for a long time. Indeed. Yeah. That we talked about a bird and said some very, very deep things about the nature of legal research. I'm yeah. impressed with us. Well, you know, it's better than talking about a cat. See, yeah. Well now that I, I'm worried about I'm worried about the uh about the birds dealing with the stray cat who lives in the library. We'll have to see how that Tom and Jerry situation plays out. Fly fly fly, little birdie. Fly fly yeah. fly. Yeah. Listeners, we come to you today uh, in the midst of a very sad time in our in our industry, and by our industry, I mean um, people who like to read. Yes, we're putting on a slightly different hat than our legal hat when we talk about industry to talk about the the journalism industry. One of the best websites out there for journalism for writing. Um, and certainly for sports, uh, Deadspin is going through a really tough period right now. They have been cannibalized um, by private equity vultures. And this week saw the mass exodus um, of, of just some of the best sports writers um, available following hot on the heels of the mask firing of the other group of the best sports writers available um, who formerly worked for Sports Illustrated. Um, I have a belief that sports writing is is actually some of the best writing, bar none, some of the best journalism, bar none, of any kind of writing, mm -hmm. um, in part because, you know, most people who watch sports think they can write about sports, right? You watch the game, why can't you talk about it? And so the competition to get a good job as a sports writer is so high that when you reach that pinnacle, you're either kind of a shameless hack Stephen A. Smith jerk face um, who should be banished from society, or you are one of the, the best kind of communicators 
of, of information in your field. And I think that's uh, Deadspin is much more the latter than the former. Um, and it's been gutted. It's it's been gut, it's being gutted right in front of our eyes, um, and it and it goes into to me lots of different issues. It's a it's a lot about journalism and the future, if there is going to be a future uh, for journalism. Um, it's also a, it's also a, a, a labor issue um, where these uh, bosses, you know, Deadspin, uh, uh, part of Go Media now, um, they're unionized writers, and that's supposed to have some protections. But despite being unionized, uh, the private equity vultures were able to, as far as we can understand, take down content without editorial approval, and then essentially fire their deputy editor for refusing to play the private equity game and putting up the content that they that the editors wanted to put up, as opposed to the owners wanted to put up, and and that that shouldn't be possible in a world with strong unions. Right, and we'll let, we'll take a. We'll take a second to focus on some of the legal aspects of what you just brought up. So this comes also on the heels of the same organization getting rid of all the splinter writers, which they did a few weeks ago. The yep. Deadspin, the reason the deputy Deadspin editor was the person on the chopping block this week is because the actual editor in chief had already left over these issues. So the Barry was operating as something of right. the interim head yeah uh, yeah, acting head uh so when you say they took things down and that shouldn't be that's because the union that they that operates there has a collective bargaining agreement as one would if you were a union and that collective bargaining agreement included provisions on how to deal with taking down posts and required to take down any post according to the agreement between management and the union was that there would have to be a meeting involving the executive editor of the publication at the time where a vote of majority vote would be taken between the CEO, the general counsel, and the executive editor. That did not happen, and they took down a post that was relatively innocuous in a lot of ways. It was that the site had started running autoplay video ads, and if you're a human being, you hate those. So... <laughs> So when you would open up the website, some blaring idiot would start screaming out of your computer, and people didn't like that. And the post said, we agree we would rather not have these on our site. If you have a problem with it, you should share that with our business side because they feel these are valuable. That is a perfectly well-meaning and important customer feedback Avenue, it was taken down in the middle of the night without any consultation with editorial, which is a violation of the collective bargaining agreement, which was then brought to their attention, which resulted in the removal of the deputy editor. And over the course of the next probably four days, the leaving of everybody. Uh, It's an important point to focus on because I've seen online um, and in other uh, media outlets um, people kind of sniggering and saying like, oh, how are autoplay video ads the hill worth dying on? First of all, they're kind of a hill worth dying on. They're the literal they, worst. Because they are the worst. And I understand business and advertisers think they're super valuable because it forces people to engage with the ad just to make it stop. But it, it's it's to me, it's such an invasion and violation because so many people are trying to read while they're doing other things, usually at work, right? So when yeah. your computer starts talking to you at work, it is embarrassing in front of your colleagues to be to basically be outed by the website you're trying to patronize right. um, for doing that on "Quote unquote work hours." Now we could go into this whole, a whole. I could go into a whole different kind of populist revolutionary way of like we shouldn't be all wage slaves um, that are afraid of you know taking some downtime in the middle of the workday. But regardless, since I understand what capitalism is, um, certainly you should not be forcing your users and readers to out themselves just by clicking on your website. But but that's not actually the hill they were dying on, okay? Uh, it, it could be worth it to die on that hill. That's not the hill that Barry Petschke and the Deadspin editors were dying on. The hill they were dying on is exactly what Joe says. It is the way in which a post is supposed to take be taken down. 
They have a structure for that. They have a collectively bargained structure for that. And their owners just ignored that in order to take down this ad criticizing uh, this, sorry, this post criticizing the autoplay ads on the site. Yeah. That, and that they, is certainly a hill worth dying on because you've collectively bargained to be on that hill. Yes, exactly. It, it, it's more of a sign of the disrespect they have for the agreement as a whole, making this very much a labor issue. You know, we're talking about a sports site, but I think to a lot of people it meant a lot more than that. And that's why, you know, Bernie Sanders is tweeting about the dead spin situation. Like, it, it's astounding to me how this sports site has grown into something that's big enough that, you know, presidential candidates feel the need to weigh in on, you know? But yeah. it really is, because this is on, because of the way in which labor law has kind of been, uh, well, labor unions as a whole have been kicked around in this country. This is one of those few situations left where there's actually a union, you know, in a non-public service sector. So, And, and is, not to go yeah. fully into kind of politics, 2020, whatever, like, one of the, the key issues for a lot of the people who are leaving Deadspin that they had is that there was the edict from on high that they, quote unquote, stick to sports. This is a very ESPN, Disney-fied, driven view of things right. that people come to sports site to want to read about sports. They don't want to hear about anything else. This is their break from the horrible political news. And I get that. I, I certainly, when I turn on a game, Part of the reason why I'm turning on the game and not cable news is that I'm sick of cable news and I want to just kind of immerse myself in something uh, that is fundamentally uh, entertainment um, as opposed to our actual news cycle. But what Deadspin understood and what they did and what they got a lot of traffic for is that there are a whole lot of cultural, social issues that express themselves through sports. Certainly as an African American, I can tell you that for all of the great work of a Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King or the whole civil rights movement, none of that happens without Jackie. Right. None of that happens without Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson doesn't happen without Jesse Owens, who, mm -hmm. you know, raced the Nazis, essentially, <laughs> uh, uh, and won, right? Like, don't tell me that our sporting culture doesn't have a role to play in the advancement of social issues, okay? That's number one. Number two, for all of these Democrats who are constantly whining and convention about how they're going to get to Trump voters and they got to they gotta get Trump voters coming back to the fold, the way to get Trump voters is not to go on Fox News. You don't go on their home turf and fight the battle on their terms with their white supremacist state propagandist network. You go get them when they're watching the game. You go wow. get them at the pep rally, right? And so one of the things that I think Deadspin did effectively was not just to talk about social issues as they as they cross over into sports, which is just basic journalism, but also present a, a way of thinking about the world that was fact-based, that eschewed the bullshit talking points from both sides, if you will, talking to people who were gettable on either side of the political spectrum because we're all coming here kind of for the same thing, which is to talk about how stupid the Jets are, right? Like you're, you're, you're getting people in a, I want to say vulnerable moment, but in a, in a moment where I feel like they're more open to conversation and it's not about having a left-right conversation. It's about having a facts, not facts conversation. And that's what Deadspin was doing. And to take that away from them um, is just, is just frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I, I, disagree with large swaths of particular things you said there, but I do think that you hit on the way in which it was, it understood that an audience is not a, uh, people who read sports websites are human beings, not sports automatons who want to see just sports news. And some of the fallout of all this has been a discussion uh, that former salespeople for the Gizmodo and before that Gawker group point out where they're saying in social media, this is just not true. The ads that we would sell on those websites were never sports related ads. They were lifestyle ads or some, you know, something about the culture. The most popular posts were the how to, you know, the recipes and stuff like that. They were always things that weren't sports, but things aimed towards 
readers who are sports fans. And that understanding that your audience is a human being who is more well-rounded and that the sports vector is only the entree to who they are and may give you some clues as to other things they may be interested in, but that you're serving that audience as a whole and not just as, here's my sports vector news, was what they did and what they were incredibly successful at, which is where I think you transition to the one other, the next legal aspect of all this, which is, The problem, which you already mentioned uh, in passing, is that this exists because of private equity as a model of investing, where you have companies who come in and say, I'm going to spend a lot of money, usually pension money, actually, which is an unfortunate aspect of this. Another labor aspect of this, one of the few other places where labor is involved is in public sector labor unions having pension funds. And those, unfortunately, are mostly hijacked by private equity groups for this sort of investment. That money is thrown in, usually more money than can be afforded. But don't worry, they once the company is acquired, all that money is moved into being debt upon that company. So the people who bought it never have to pay it. It goes to that company. And the argument is maybe they can find a way to gussy it up in a, such that it can be sold at a quick turnaround profit and they walk away with everything and somebody else is left holding the bag. Or if it goes down the tubes, well, the company's what's charged with the debt, not us. We collected our fees and we move on. It's that kind of mindset that some candidates in the election have talked about the need to reform our laws, in particular tax and bankruptcy laws, as well as corporation laws, because a lot of this happens because for a lot of the good that it does, having LLCs and you know ways in which you can structure your business so that you don't you know get destroyed every time you take a risk. However, the flip side is you embolden kind of a moral hazard behavior of we're going to throw tons of debt on this company that probably can't afford to maintain it, but it doesn't matter. We're never going to be stuck with those consequences. So that's the other legal aspect of what's going on with this company is that to some extent, the incentives got messed up because when it came to that stick to sports, even though, as the salespeople pointed out, the real profit to be had in Deadspin was in the appealing to culture, because that was where they were really making their money. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted to make it just sports because, I mean, you, you could say that they didn't understand the business. But it, but if we take them, give them the benefit of the doubt and say cynically what it was, was it wasn't whether or not they cared about whether it was sticking to sports. They figured the next rummy to come along that they would sell it to would want it to just be sports. It's not about making money to them. It's about figuring out how to position the company so it's easier to sell to the next person who has no idea what they're doing. That that's and the that's the point, man. Like structuring it for a mark. Dead spin was profitable. Yeah. Okay. Like everybody's talking about, oh, there's no money being made. No. Dead spin was profitable. And the vultures who bought it didn't want to make that profit. <laughs> Yes. They just wanted to sell it. And exactly as you say, they thought it would be easier to sell as an anodyne kind of game box score recap site yeah. as opposed to the site that was profitable. Correct. And, and, and that's, where, that's where when we talk about law, talk about this from a legal perspective, that's going to be a real issue. And it's it's happening with Deadspin, but it's certainly not only happening with Deadspin. It's been happening with newspapers across the country. It's happening throughout media. This model of investment, which, you know, could, there are arguments for private equity investment and reasons why it could be very good about helping companies out. Obviously, a lot of startups operate with venture capital raised through private means that is the only way in which we end up with all sorts of technological advancements. That said, this model also, with the paucity of regulations upon it right now, puts us in a position where it is very easy to have incentives go the wrong way. And behaviors that are destructive to the economy are privileged as opposed to punished. Yep. Yeah. And I think I know that, a candidate that has a plan for that. Yeah. I I, I I'm sure, and, and uh, there, are, there are more than one who uh, view this as a problem. But this is going to be a challenge that I think we should all spend more time looking for, you know, it's to get back to the library. Maybe this is a way that we, we go full circle. 
I don't know, not a lot of people just read law reviews for fun, but the legal scholarship that is going to be growing out of how we should approach regulating this sort of investment strategy is important work. And we should all take a trip down to the library and read the most recent outings of people who are working on that problem because it's it's a real one. Oh. See how I did it in a real, like, we got back to the library. We got talked. Yeah, we did everything. Anyway, That's so great, with- Joe. Yeah, I, I give listen, yourself a, a give yourself a cheer on the on the soundboard. Oh yeah, no, that's a good point. Where is my soundboard? I actually didn't open it up, which was so sad. Um, we'll put yeah, that in post. Go. Yeah, no, no, we got it. Um, so yeah, so with all that said, thanks for listening, and you should be subscribed to the show. You should give it reviews, not just the stars. I know that's easy, but we'll take the little bit extra ask and just throw in some words about this is a fun way to learn about. Law, what's going on in law schools or whatever. All those words are valuable because algorithms, the things that rule our lives these days, take that and it moves it up the list of recommended podcasts, which means that more people get to listen to it. You should also be reading Above the Law, as always, a website that has good news, not just sticking to law. Sometimes we get a field of that, but it's all for you, the human being who has a legal interest. And also, we're not owned by you, private equity. Yeah, true. You should follow at L-E-N-Y-C to see his costume. You should follow at Joseph Patrice. That's me. I did not have a picture of a costume. You should be listening to the other shows available from the Legal Talk Network. There was an episode recently of On the Road that I was a guest on uh, from the Clio Cloud Conference. So that is one you should go check out. You should listen to the Jabot, which is Catherine Rubino's podcast. She also is been a guest and guest host of this show sometimes and with all of those things said i think we're done oh and of of course thanks to logical for sponsoring the show and with that i think we're now fully done peace if you'd like more information about what you heard today please visit legaltalknetwork.com you can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.